Welcome friends. Today is our video on another titan of not only the American Civil War, but of American history itself. Today we will be covering one of my favorite presidents, and that would be Ulysses S. Grant. But as always, thanks for watching and helping the channel grow. I really do support, appreciate the support, and always please like, share, comment, and subscribe. Uh, also, just heads up, this is going to be a very long video. Thanks again, and let's get into it. Hiram Ulysses Grant was born in Point Pleasant, Ohio, on April 27, 1822. His father, Jesse Root Grant, was a Whig abolitionist, the son of an American Revolution veteran who fought at Bunker Hill, and Hannah Simpson, who was the daughter of a Revolution veteran who personally served under George Washington. Hiram was the oldest of six children, three boys and three girls. He was named after his maternal grandfather, and his middle name was chosen by lottery. His father, Jesse, would mostly refer to him by his middle name, Ulysses. The family moved to Georgia, Ohio in 1823, Georgetown, Ohio, in 1823. For much of Grant's childhood, he would go in and out of private schools where he excelled as a student. Though his parents were Methodist, he grew up uh, non-denominational. Uh, so that's like you believe in God, but you really don't have a set organized church, so to speak. Um, this is something he would continue into adulthood. In 1839, Jesse wrote to local representative Thomas Hamer, to get his son an appointment to the United States Military Academy at West Point. Jesse was concerned due to he and Hamer being political opponents. Hamer, a pro-slavery Democrat and Jesse an abolitionist Whig. However, Hamer did recommend Grant and on July 1st, he was admitted. However, Congressman Hamer messed up his name on the recommendation. So when Grant arrived at West Point, all his document, documentation said U.S. Grant instead of correcting the military. He was convinced by his other colleagues to keep it and adopt his mother's maiden name as his new initial, Simpson. His friends would also see the U.S. and refer to him as Uncle Sam, which is where he received his nickname of Sam. He also became friends with a young man named Pete. For those of you who follow our channel, you know who Pete was, and it was James Pete Longstreet. His time at West Point was an interesting time for Grant. At first, he disliked it, but then he began to excel, especially in horsemanship, where for 25 years, he actually held the record for the high jump. But he much more enjoyed poetry and the arts. He detested the Academy's requirement of attending religious services. He would graduate 21st in his class of 39 in 1843. However, though... A champion horseman, he was assigned to the infantry, an infantry post in Missouri, it is here where he meet Julia Bog Dent, the daughter of a local plantation owner and also James Longstreet's distant cousin. The two would become engaged in 1844. Jesse and Hannah, however, greatly disapproved of the match due to their abolitionist beliefs and the fact that Julia's family owned slaves. When, two, when the two were married in 1848, neither of Grant's parents attended the wedding in St. Louis, Missouri. It's highly debated, but Moxley Sorrell, one of, Sorrell, I didn't mean to say it that way, I apologize, one of Longstreet's aides, in his memoirs that were published posthumously, stated that Longstreet was Grant's best man. He was given two months leave where he and Julia decided that he would remain in the military. However, the reason for the long engagement was because in 1846, the Polk administration, with support of Congress, declared war on Mexico. Initially, Grant was only a quartermaster, but he wanted to prove his worth. At the Battle of Monterey, he proved his bravery and equestrian skills when he rode on the side of his horse while Mexican infantry fired on him in a desperate attempt to get more ammunition. When General Taylor was removed and General Scott took his place, Grant was present at many battles throughout the war, where he even met a middle-aged engineer officer on General Scott's staff. The man's name was Robert E. Lee. Lee met him and saw a lot of promise in the young man. When peace came, Grant began to move garrison to garrison. Finally, his military career seemed to end while he was stationed in California in 1853 due to depression from missing his wife and family. 
he began to drink. His choice was to reform or resign, and to save himself from the embarrassment of being removed, he resigned. Grant had multiple business, failed business ventures, but then became a farmer. He, with his wife, slave Dan, ran the farm, but soon that failed as well. His father-in-law gave him another slave to help, but he did not support the idea of owning men. Because he could not do anything about Dan because he was his wife's. But the slave that his father-in-law gave him, he immediately freed. He finally, in 1860, would go to work for his father, Jesse's Tannery. Grant would be one of the first men to offer his service to the Union in April of 1861. Correctly assuming before resigning, uh, quickly assuming before resigning, being captain would give him a higher position in the new army. Grant would be put in command of the 21st Regiment in Missouri to combat Confederate forces in 1861. With assistance of his superiors, he was elevated to the rank of Brigadier General Volunteers. Again, this is a sort of emergency general. Since the regular army was split, the majority of the forces were volunteers. He would move to Kentucky and inform the citizenry, I have not come here as your enemy, but as your friend. After aiding in Kentucky's neutrality, he was ordered to use his troops to demonstrate, not attack, demonstrate their strength to the Confederates on the Mississippi. Lincoln, however, in November of 1861, removed Grant's superior, John C. Fremont. This now gave Grant his chance to act on his strategies, mainly being he was an ardent supporter of Winfield Scott's Anaconda plan. So he would, so he wanted to take the fight to the Confederates and start seizing Western states. His new commander, Henry Halleck, allowed him the autonomy to attack Cape Girardeau, but he would not give him the chance to try out his other tactics of seizing other primary locations in the West without McClellan's direct advice. But with McClellan's approval, Grant and Halleck would fight a draw at the Battle of Belmont in Mississippi, but then win two victories at Fort Donelson in Tennessee and Fort Henry on the Kentucky-Tennessee border in 1862. Halleck, however, had become concerned that Grant had fallen back into his old habit of drinking and wrote to Washington about it. Lincoln, however, with constant defeats in the East, instead of removing Grant, promoted him to a major general. Now, the plan was to continue seizing the Mississippi, so Grant started to amass troops near Savannah, Tennessee. His army would encamp for four miles upriver at Pittsburgh Landing, he was to meet with General Don Carlos Buell at Savannah. Buell was approaching from Nashville. The plan was Halleck would arrive and Grant's Army of West Tennessee, soon to be called Army of the Tennessee, and Buell's Army of Ohio would march to Corinth, Mississippi and start seizing the Mississippi River. However, Albert Sidney Johnson and the man who fired on Fort Sumter, PGT Beauregard, were not going to allow them to move forward without any resistance. So on April 6, 1862, at about 7.30 a.m., 40,000 Confederates of the Army of Mississippi smashed into the Army of the Tennessee. Grant was four miles away and could hear the gunfire in the distance. He simply wiped his mouth and said, I suppose that starts it. William Tecumseh Sherman, who was pretty much the field commander at this time, and had be, been wounded, but was still on the field. The Southerners were collapsing the Union lines, but Grant was able to stabilize the situation. At night, the wounded Sherman would say, Well, Grant, we've had the devil's own day, haven't we? Grant, who became famous for how cool under pressure he was, simply re responded, Yeah, lick him tomorrow, though. That night, federal reinforcements arrived, along with gunboats. The next day, with his army and Buell's, they charged into the thinly spread Confederate forces. The Confederates, they forced the Confederates to retreat back to Corinth, Mississippi. In two days, Shiloh left 23,000 casualties. Shiloh changed the country's perspective on the war. It will be a war to the death. Grant would then follow Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation, beginning to incorporate freed slaves into his army and he was named Commander of the Army of the Tennessee unequivocally. Halleck will be promoted to Commander-in-Chief of Union Forces, 
taking him away from Grant and would begin where and at this time Grant would begin his most famous campaign. He would target the trade hub at Vicksburg, Mississippi in 1862. I do plan to do a series on Vicksburg, uh, the campaign and everything, but the city fell on July 4th, 1863. This would be followed by his victory at the Battle of Chattanooga during the Chattanooga campaign. After this, he would be appointed by the president as commander-in-chief of all Union forces, and his former commander, Henry Halleck, was named his chief of staff. Instead of other commanders like Scott and Halleck, Grant based himself with George Meade and the Army of the Potomac. In his opinion, even with Lee and the Army of Northern Virginia wounded, he still was the greatest threat to the Union. He gave William Tecumseh Sherman the command of the Western Theater. Meade and Grant began the Overlands Campaign. So our next uh, episode is actually going to be on the Overlands Campaign. So... Uh, what I'm going to do here is just start after the Overlands campaign. So we're going to fast forward to, uh, after the surrender of the Confederate army. Grant was supposed to go to the theater with the president on the 14th of April, but his wife, Julia did not want to mostly because she disliked the first lady, which wasn't very uncommon. Not a lot of people like Mary Todd Lincoln. The couple, however, decided instead to hop on a train to visit one of their children who were in New Jersey at the time. On their way to the train station, there is a very famous account from Julia Grant. Their carriage was stopped. First two leather gloves appeared in the window pane. Then a mustached man peeked his head in and stared at the couple. Julia would identify the man as John Wilkes Booth. Later that evening, Booth would shoot President Lincoln in the back of the head. Lincoln would die in the early hours of the 15th. A conspiracy was then unveiled. Booth, with his conspirators, were set to kill Lincoln, Secretary of State William Seward, Vice President Andrew Johnson, and even General Grant. For he was indeed supposed to be with Lincoln that night. At Lincoln's funeral on the 19th, as columns of soldiers passed followed by the President's coffin, Grant began to openly cry in front of all the crowds of thousands. He would go on to say about Lincoln, he was the greatest man I had ever known. Grant was now handling Lot as the commander of the armies. In December of 1861, the Second French Empire had actually landed 40,000 troops in Mexico in a direct breach of the Monroe Doctrine, as well as placing an Austrian Habsburg prince as Emperor of Mexico. Though the Confederates had surrendered, their Native American allies had become more combative, refusing to surrender, which dragged men like uh, George Custard and Phil Sheridan out west to battle them. It's also at this time he was given the official rank General of the Army, a five-star rank that commanded all volunteers and regular military forces. Grant would be first of only eight people in American history to hold this rank. Grant attempted to work with Andrew Johnson, but in, June of, but in June, an attorney general in Norfolk, Virginia, charged Lee and other high-ranking Confederates with treason, a charge punishable by death. Grant was furious and confronted Johnson about it. Johnson wanted to make Lee and the others an example for the world to see, but according to the Articles of Surrender, approved by Lincoln and Grant and signed by Lee, they were not to be touched. When Johnson refused to pull the charges, Grant promised he would resign. Politically, this would ruin the already hated Johnson. So Johnson agreed, and all the charges were dropped. He would then tour the South, checking out the military districts along with working with newly established Freedmen Bureau that was helping thousands of freed slaves. But it was also this time he began to get very upset with Johnson. Congress had passed three Reconstruction Acts, all of which Johnson tried to veto. But Congress was able to override them all. Grant privately called Johnson a national disgrace. In 1867, Johnson dismissed the Secretary of War, Edwin Stanton, naming Grant as acting Secretary of War. Now, this was illegal because of the Tenure of Office Act, which said the President could not dismiss 
a member of the cabinet without Senate approval. Grant initially took the position because he feared a more conservative candidate would derail the Reconstruction. But then on January 13th, 1868, Grant returned the office and title to Stanton, which infuriated Johnson. This also led to the first presidential impeachment in American history and completely tarnished Johnson's image. In 1868, the Republican Party nominated Grant as their presidential nominee with the Speaker of the House of Representatives, Schuyler Colfax, as his running mate. At the age of 46, Grant was elected by an electoral landslide as the next President of the United States. His main focus was completing Lincoln's plan on Reconstruction, but another issue had risen. Disgruntled and racist Confederates and plantation owners created an organization naming former Confederate General Nathan B. Forrest as their leader. The Ku Klux Klan. They would wear hoods and ride the countryside, harassing freedmen and women. They had also murdered many Republican lawmakers. They had become the militant arm of the Southern Democrats, who would go out and kill Republicans and freedmen and women. Grant would champion the Enforcement Acts, laws that Congress would give to the executive office with one job, to stomp out the Ku Klux Klan. Grant, using his military district commanders and his new commander of the armies, William Tecumseh Sherman, outlawed the Klan and made it a crime just to be associated with them. However, however, other organizations such as the White League and Red Shirts would rise. Using intimidation, they would help Democrats rise back to power in the South and stifle the African American and Republican votes. Grant would do a lot towards helping veterans and war bonds. Even at one point attempting to annex the Dominican Republic, uh, this was to help provide a safe place for the freedmen and women to go, and he also attempted to uh, even have war bonds paid back with actual gold. Uh, unfortunately, the gold did work, but the annexation of the Dominican Republic would fall through. His second term was cursed with scandals by his cabinet members and eroded his administration's popularity, but not his own. He was still beloved by the nation. However, in the tradition, he decided to do two terms and then left office. He would go on a world tour with Julia, where they would meet the Pope, Queen Victoria, Otto von Bismarck, Emperor Meiji, and Li Hongzong, who ran the Qing dynasty the way Bismarck ran the Hohenzollern dynasty. When he returned, he had discovered that his son had been swindled out of the family's fortune, and they would have to survive off his military pension, which was not that much and sadly died with him. Grant would have some more failed business ventures and even try to run for a third term, but he wasn't capable of getting the momentum he once had. Grant now was retiring to his estate in Winton, New York. In 1884, Grant was diagnosed with throat cancer caused by intensive cigar smoking over the years. He attempted to keep it a secret from Julia, but his doctor would inform her. Knowing he was not much longer for the world, and his pension would die with him, he agreed to write his memoirs, which the Century Magazine offered to publish and give his family the royalties. But Grant's friend, the 50-year-old Mark Twain, counter-offered. Twain will publish his memoir, and the Grant family will get all profits from the sales, not just the royalties. Grant agreed and began to work on his memoirs, which he would finish July of 1885. Then after months of struggling, the pain of the cancer, he passed away July 23rd, 1885. Phil Sheridan, his cavalry commander, who is now commander of the armies, was crushed and ordered mourning on all military bases. President Grover Cleveland, declared a 30-day period of mourning. Grant's body would be laid in state at West Point Military Academy and then travel by rail to New York City, where 1.5 million people would watch as tens of thousands of members of the Grand Army of the Republic, the Union Veteran Association, marched once more with their commander and laid him to rest in Riverside Park. Twelve years later, his body would be removed and placed at Grant's mausoleum 
in Morningside Heights in New York City, where he is today with Julia. After his death, Twain kept his word, and Julia and her children would receive $450,000 from the sales, which today would be close to $14 million. However, in the post-Reconstruction era, Grant's reputation would suffer with the birth of the Lost Cause myth. That made Grant out to be a drunkard who let his mad dog Sherman loose to destroy the South and painted Lee as a fallen hero who did all he could to defend the South. But the truth is simple. Grant was a hero. Grant was the American story. He was born dirt poor, but through skill and determination, he rose up and made a name for himself. Grant is my second favorite president personally. He had literal... He had a literal nation on his shoulders, and he fought his whole life to preserve that nation. He has monuments all over the country, to be completely honest. Heck, his tomb is a monument. But I would like to shed light on his monument in Washington, D.C. It sits in front of the Capitol building, and it portrays him as he was. A soldier. A man who roughed it out with his soldiers and stayed on the field with them. Now, tomorrow we will... We will have our Overlands campaign and end of the war video. Uh, then we will have our core video, and that will probably be the last video in our Army of the Potomac series. Um, then after that, we will be doing the Army of Northern Virginia. Thanks for watching, friends. I know this was a long one. Grant was quite poss quite a person, and I feel I didn't even do him justice. But he was, but we covered as much as we could. I'm going to actually leave links to other Grant subjects. You know, uh, Leonardo DiCaprio actually made a fantastic series about Grant. Um, I'm going to leave a link to that. It's actually from the History Channel. Uh, if you're a new viewer, please, I invite you to subscribe, join our community, and as always, please like, share, and comment, and we'll see you in the next one. The Friend of My Adversity... I shall always cherish most. I can better trust those who have helped to relieve the gloom of my dark hours than those who are so ready to enjoy me, the sunshine of my prosperity. Ulysses S. Grant